Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. That is from the book of Proverbs, book seven. The book of Proverbs is addressed to a young man at the beginning of his educational and life journey, perhaps by his father, who may be King Solomon himself. In these lines, wisdom is a sister and a kinswoman, someone who belongs to the community and who should be trusted and courted. Woman wisdom is the opposite of the strange woman, the Isha Zara, a foreigner from another land and culture. The strange woman tempts young men with her flattering words and also with her kisses, her impudent face and her bed decked with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt, perfumed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. And this strange woman, she's closely allied with another enemy of woman wisdom, Lady Folly, who appeals to men's sensual impulses and abuses language through flattery and sophism. She becomes the main character of Erasmus's The Praise of Folly, a Renaissance bestseller. Today, I want to look at Shakespeare's Cleopatra as a composite of woman wisdom and the strange woman of Proverbs. First, a little bit of background on the book of Proverbs. In the Hebrew Bible, the book of Proverbs is part of the Ketuvim, or writings, where most of the works that we identify now as wisdom literature are gathered. The book of Proverbs is composed of six units. The first nine poems, in which woman wisdom appears, is a prologue to the collection as a whole. Now, these wisdom poems were likely composed last, perhaps in the Persian or even in the Hellenistic period, and they reflect the international quality of exilic and second temple life. The third grouping of Proverbs, which is much older, is a recasting of the sayings of Amenemope, a second millennium BCE Egyptian text. It was written by an Egyptian scribe for his son, not unlike the book of Proverbs. What really interests me here are the various ways in which the book of Proverbs reflects a broader Near Eastern context, both a very ancient Egyptian one and more recent Persian and Hellenistic influences. Let's hear this Persianate Hellenistic woman wisdom from Proverbs 8. I, wisdom, dwell together with prudence. I possess knowledge and discretion. Counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have insight. I have power. I walk in the way of righteousness along the paths of justice, bestowing a rich inheritance on those who love me and making their treasuries full. The Lord brought me forth as the first of his works. Before his deeds of old, I was formed long ages ago, at the very beginning, when the world came to be. When there were no watery depths, I was given birth. When there were no springs overflowing with water, then I was constantly at his side. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in his whole world, and delighting in mankind. A few things I'd like you to notice here. First, wisdom herself is speaking. This is a dramatic personification, and she's delivering an eratology, an account of the deeds and virtues of a divine being, from arate, meaning virtue or excellence. Notice that wisdom is associated with God's creative capacities. She was with him before the world came into being as a counselor, consort, or confidant. 
And she's also depicted as his delight, like a daughter whose capacities for imaginative play bring joy to the parents. Bible scholars suggest that woman wisdom is based on Near Eastern goddesses of love, wisdom, and fertility, such as Ishtar and the Egyptian goddess Isis. We've already heard an eratology of wisdom in Proverbs 8. Let's hear an eratology of Isis. This one composed by the North African author Apuleius in Latin in the second century CE. I am she that is the natural mother of all things, mistress and governess of all the elements, the initial progeny of worlds, chief of the powers divine, queen of heaven, the principle of the gods celestial, the light of the goddesses. At my will, the planets of the air, the wholesome winds of the seas, and the silences of hell be disposed. My name, my divinity, is adored throughout all the world, in diverse manners, in variable customs, and in many names. For the Phrygians call me the mother of the gods, the Athenians, Minerva, the Cyprians, Venus, but principally the Ethiopians, which dwell in the Orient, and the Egyptians, which are excellent in all kind of ancient doctrine, and by their proper ceremonies, accustomed to worship me, do call me Queen Isis. So there's a lot there. Notice that Isis is a thoroughly international goddess associated with Egypt and Ethiopia, but thoroughly Hellenized or rendered Greek by her assimilation with Athena, goddess of wisdom, and Venus, goddess of love. She's also associated with nature, or what in the Hebrew tradition we call creation, the beauty and sublimity of God's works. Woman wisdom in Proverbs and in other Hebrew wisdom writings draws on the power, creativity, and cosmic reach of these female wisdom goddesses. Like Isis, woman wisdom is international and may reflect Greek philosophizing as well as Egyptian religion. The Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, was produced by and for Greek-speaking Jews in Alexandria in Egypt. The Septuagint includes several works that feature woman wisdom, who is called Sophia in these Greek texts. So around Sophia and wisdom, you have this really rich confluence of Hebrew, Greek, and Egyptian wisdom literature coming into contact with each other over a series of centuries and leading to these beautiful poems featuring woman wisdom as a quasi-divine being who is God's partner in creation. But maybe this cosmopolitan and even vaguely pagan woman wisdom is a bit of a problem. Hence, the strange woman enters as a counterweight. We could say that the strange woman brings out what is foreign in woman wisdom, what is not thoroughly Hebrew, and marks her alien quality as threatening and seduct seductive. I think Cleopatra combines elements of both woman wisdom and the strange woman. As we move towards Shakespeare, here are a few things about the historical Cleopatra. She was born in 69 BCE, and she died by her own hand in 30 BCE. She was the last of the Ptolemies, the Greek Macedonian rulers of Egypt. She identified herself with Isis and Aphrodite in her royal cult. She was highly educated in Greek philosophy, and she spoke many languages, including Hebrew. And she lost the war with the Romans, who got to tell her story their way. Shakespeare's main source for Antony and Cleopatra is the Greek Platonist and Delphic priest Plutarch, 
who wrote biographies of famous men, including Mark Antony. But Plutarch also wrote essays, and one of those is on Isis and Osiris. This lengthy piece is a kind of database or Wikipedia entry cataloging what Shakespeare might have known about Isis. For example, he identifies her with wisdom. Plutarch says that Isis was a goddess exceptionally wise and a lover of wisdom. Isis also made her way to Rome. These images are from the temple of Isis at Pompeii, southeast of Naples. Notice that the attributes of Isis include the snake and the crocodile, both of which show up in Shakespeare's play. Here we see priests and votaresses of different ethnicities. Some of them are enslaved people and some are free or freed, worshiping Isis at Rome. And this Roman sarcophagus depicts African worshipers of Isis. So what do we make of all this in Antony and Cleopatra? How does Cleopatra's self-staging of herself as Isis also become a claim about wisdom? What attributes does this Greco-Egyptian queen share with the wisdom of Proverbs 1 to 9 and the Greek wisdom books of the Septuagint? Well, Shakespeare, like everyone else in his generation, tells the Roman side of the story. For the Romans, Cleopatra is a seducer, a virago. She seems flighty and petty and easily jealous. In other words, she is more like the strange woman of Proverbs than woman wisdom. Yet, as the play progresses, Shakespeare warms up to Cleopatra, and she increasingly commands our respect as well as our fascination. Early on, Antony's friend Enobarbus praises Cleopatra's infinite variety. This phrase resembles Plutarch's description of Isis as the female principle of nature who, quote, turns herself into this or that thing and is receptive to all manners of shapes and forms. Infinite variety also resembles the woman wisdom or Sophia of the Septuagint. Quote, for in her is an understanding spirit, holy, one only, manifold, subtle, lively, clear. For wisdom is more moving than any motion. She passeth and goeth through all things. So where are Cleopatra's wisdom poems? Well, I'd begin with her elegy for the dead Antony. I understand not, madam. I dreamed there was an Emperor Antony. Oh, such another sleep that I might see, but such another man. If it might please you. His face was as the heavens, and therein stuck a sun and moon which kept their course and lighted the little O, the earth. Most sovereign creature. His legs bestrid the ocean. His reared arm crested the world. His voice was propertied as all the tuned spheres, and that to friends. But when he meant to quail and shake the orb, he was as rattling thunder. For his bounty, there was no winter in it. An autumn it was that grew the more by reaping. His delights were dolphin-like. They showed his back above the element they lived in. In his livery walked crowns and crownets. Realms and islands were as plates dropped from his pockets. Cleopatra, think you there was or might be such a man as this I dreamt of? Gentle madam, no. You lie. 
up to the hearing of the gods. But if there be, nor ever were one such, it's past the size of dreaming. She declares that, quote, his legs bestrid the ocean. This sublime image recalls the Colossus of Rhodes, also evoked by Shakespeare in Julius Caesar, who was her earlier lover. I also hear echoes of the Song of Songs, where the Queen of Sheba or the Shulamite praises Solomon's resplendent person. Sheba herself is both a seeker of wisdom and a foreigner, combining woman wisdom with the Isha Zara of Proverbs. The Shulamite says, his legs are as pillars of marble set upon sockets of fine gold. In the same speech, Cleopatra declares that Antony's delights were dolphin-like. They showed his back above the element they lived in. This wonderful image describes Antony's ability to rise above the sea of politics and reflect something higher and more beautiful through and because of his love for her. The image reminds me of Psalm 104, where the Leviathan is described as God's plaything. Quote, there go the ships, yea, that Leviathan, whom thou hast made to play therein. This image of God reveling in creativity at play in turn recalls wisdom herself in Proverbs 8, quote, daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. In Cleopatra's wisdom poem, erotic praise takes on cosmic dimensions. And Antony is not only a great hero, but he also comes to reflect the order and beauty of the cosmos itself. And then there is Cleopatra's own amazing death speech. Give me my robe. Put on my crown. I have immortal longings in me. Now no more the juice of Egypt's grape shall moist the slip. Yar, yar, good Iris, quick. Methinks I hear Antony call. I see him rouse himself to praise my noble act. I hear him mock the luck of Caesar, which the gods give men to excuse their after wrath. Husband, I come. Now to that name, my courage prove my title. I am fire and air. My other elements I give to baser life. So, have you done? Come then, and take the last warmth of my lip. Farewell, kind Charmian. Iris, long farewell. Have I the aspic in my lips? Dost fall? If thou and nature can so gently part, the stroke of death is as a lover's pinch, which hurts and is desired. Dost thou lie still? If thus thou vanishest, thou tells the world it is not worth leave taking. This proves me base. If first she meet the curled Antony, he'll make demand of her and spend that kiss, which is my heaven to have. Come, thou mortal wretch, with thy sharp teeth, this not intrinsicate of life at once untie. Oh, poor venomous fool, be angry and dispatch. Oh, couldst thou speak that I might hear thee call great Caesar ass unpolicied? Oh, oh, oh peace. <laughs> 
peace. Dost thou not see my baby at my breast? That sucks the nurse asleep. Oh, oh, sweet as balm, as soft as air, as gentle. Oh. Antony, oh. nay, I, I, I will take thee too. Mm. What? Should I stay? The speech begins with a sublime act of costuming. Give me my robe, put on my crown. I have immortal longings in me. She is dressing as a queen, but she's also dressing as a goddess, since sovereignty had a divine dimension. She describes herself as nursing the snake, recalling those images of Isis nursing the infant Horus, as well as the crocodile and snake attributes of the goddess Isis. What are the more specifically wisdom elements? Well, here I would point to her desire to become fire and air. The four elements for the ancients were fire, air, earth, and water. She is leaving the baser elements of human embodiment, mud, which mixes earth and water, in order to become the higher elements of fire and air. Think of woman wisdom present with God at creation as his consort participating with him in the elemental design of the world. Thought itself in its creative dimensions resembles fire and air in its velocity and in materiality, and it's linked to a kind of world spirit or world logos. She has immortal longings. In dying, Cleopatra is becoming one with the universe and its cosmic ordering. Egyptian Isis, Hebrew wisdom, and Greek Aphrodite converge in this Alexandrian, this Greco-Egyptian apotheosis. Like the creator God and his consort wisdom, Shakespeare the dramaturg and the historical Cleopatra, the savvy and learned political actor, collaborate on this epiphanic orchestration of human being dissolving into cosmic order. The poetic pluralism of wisdom literature and its Alexandrian cultivation among Greeks, Egyptians, and Jews energize Cleopatra's own becoming idea. So what does Cleopatra mean to me? Well, it's certainly not about imitating Cleopatra. It's rather about understanding Cleopatra as a place where multiple wisdom literatures meet. For me, reading Antony and Cleopatra in the context of wisdom literature opened my eyes to how much circulation there was in the ancient world among different traditions. I loved learning more about woman wisdom and reading the scholarship debating her origins and sources. I also enjoyed delving into the historical Cleopatra and learning about her training in various types of knowledge, including philosophy, religion, foreign languages, statecraft, and even medical research. So for me, Cleopatra is an invitation to become more attentive to the non-Western sources of Western literature, the non-Jewish sources of Hebrew texts, and the female faces of philosophy and spiritual practice. Cleopatra has helped me recognize just how much the word wisdom is precisely a name for those intercultural conversations and confluences. And that makes my world just a little bit bigger. What about yours? Mm -hmm.